So let me just get right down to it, I suppose. The American poet and naturalist uh, Henry David Thoreau had this very famous immortal expression, uh, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. You've probably heard this before. And of course, that can mean all sorts of things. What he was referring to, especially with this comment, was that um, people are tethered to this banal, laborious, boring, um, commitment to their uh, economic livelihood. He was talking about their work obligations, basically, in terms of their, um, uh, their leading lives of quiet desperation. But I think, in fact, that we can actually understand this also in the sense of people's um, sexual repression. The mass of men also lead lives of dramatic sexual repression. In fact, there are some literary theorists that have identified Thoreau as being possibly a latent homosexual. They've seen this in his writing, at least. Um, so that kind of lends a unique perspective to that particular famous quotation. Now, regardless of Thoreau's um, 19th century sexual leanings, there are certainly lots of men, um, and I'm talking about men especially in this case, at least, there are certainly lots of men who lead lives, millions of men who lead lives that are entirely closeted in contemporary American society. Um, in fact, there was a recent uh, analysis by an, by a, an economist at Harvard um, sort of crunching the data to find out the percentage of men in American society who are certifiably homosexual. Now, if you look at the, the data, the, the survey data, and people who are self-identifying as gay men, it's actually lower than the reality. At least this is his interpretation. Um, Three percent of American males self-identify as being gay on these anonymous survey. But this particular experimenter, this researcher at Harvard, um, didn't believe that. He thought that perhaps this is obfuscating um, a, a lot of gay men that are leading lives in the closet. So to get at the accurate percentage of how many men are really homosexual in American society, he looked at this particular um, data point, which was the online search for gay pornography, um, looking at particular terms that they use for searching for gay porn. And on the basis of this, he found that it's probably closer to 5% um, of the uh, American male population that would be most attracted to other men. Uh, what does this say? What does this tell us, really, about um, um, the status of gay men? in this case, in contemporary American society. Well, it certainly tells us that um, no matter what the methodological uh, analysis involves, even if it involves some sort of anonymous survey where people are assured that no matter what they actually say in terms of how they answer this question about their sexual orientation, who they're attracted to in terms of the gender, um, and it can't be connected in any possible way to their actual name, they can't, they can't be identified in terms of their sexual orientation, well, millions of men are still lying about who they're attracted to. He also looked at a data point that is a little bit more surprising and is also, I think, quite revealing. He looked at um, suspicious wives, wives going on Google to find out if their husbands are actually gay. So if you go on Google and uh, you type in the search bar, um, how do I know if my husband is? The most common answer to that question, in terms of statistical analysis, is gay. That's the first word that pops up. In fact, it's 10 times more common than the word cheating. Um, so certainly there are loads of women that are incredibly suspicious about whether um, their husbands are leading these deceptive lives. So what does this tell us exactly about um, Sexuality in American society, at least sexuality when it comes to gay men in this case. Well, I think personally that it suggests that we are still terrorizing as a society. We're still, we're still absolutely horrifying um, men 
into the closet. Uh, we're leading them to deceive, especially people that they care deeply about, um, because they fear exposure so incredibly deeply. What else does it tell us? I think that it tells us that, that gay men are having sex with people that they prefer probably not to have sex with, and they're not having sex with those that they would rather have sex with. So, I, you know, one of the more, more disconcerting or startling aspects of being in the closet uh, that we don't often think about, actually, is the fact that um, if you're in the closet, not only are you interfering with or um, somehow causing distress and problems for your own sexual enjoyment or contentment, but you're also causing significant distress um, or interfering with the sexual content of somebody that you're married to, if it happens to be the opposite sex uh, in this, this type of relationship. Now, this problem isn't, however, necessarily limited to the homosexual population. I think that we need to look at the bigger picture here. There are all sorts of ways that our, you know, sort of imagining that we're having sex with somebody, for instance, that we'd rather not be having sex with, um, can play a role in our everyday, uh, sort of everyday satisfaction. Let's say, for instance, that you are a zoophile. Now, I've written a couple of articles for magazines about um, uh, different types of sexual deviations. I got a really interesting email from a reader who happened to be a zoophile. Now, a zoophile is somebody who is genuinely, certifiably more aroused, more sexually attracted to other species, members of other species, than they are to members of the human population. So this is qualitatively different than bestiality. Alfred Kinsey, which is a, you know, he was a very famous um, sexologist, writing in the 1950s mostly, uh, thought that bestiality occurred mostly with um, farm-bred adolescent males. This, this was his expression. Farm-bred adolescent males that simply couldn't find a willing human partner. So they used animals as a surrogate uh, for sexual relationships. But we now know, um, over the past decade or so, we now know that there really is a type of sexual orientation, individuals, who certifiably are more aroused by other species than by human beings. How do we know that? Well, you have to look at um, physiological data. You use plethysmography, these sort of penile erection detection devices, basically. You show all sorts of different pictures. You, said, you show pictures of dogs or horses, and combine those with pictures of naked, attractive human beings. And the zoophiles will get more aroused in terms of their erection strength um, by the animals in these types of scenarios. So they're not lying. They really are more aroused by other species. Um, and this man told me, he was very clear in terms of his uh, sharing this information with me, that um, he was aware that something was different uh, from him when, when, he combined, when he compared himself to other teenage boys, for instance, that were going to... Uh, Playboy. They were, you know, they were masturbating to Playboy volumes or issues. And he was going to the library and he was checking out issues of Equus magazine. And he was looking at really attractive images of horses. And this is what, what he was masturbating to. And the only way that he could consummate his marriage to a woman, a human woman, was by uh, imagining while he was having sex with her that he was actually having sex with a horse. Um, now, most of us wouldn't do that, I don't think. Most of us in this room, there could be a couple of zoophiles in here. I don't want to make any, um, I don't want to come to any um, false conclusions here. But most of us, I would imagine, are not necessarily zoophiles. But I would imagine that we have all had experiences while we're having sex with our preferred sexual partner. We close our eyes. We pretend that we're having sex with somebody else. So the question is, who really are we having sex with? Are we having sex with our partner? Or are we having sex with this imaginary, fictive entity that we're creating or conjuring up in our mind? Now, when it comes to unrequited love, I think this is a really interesting issue. And I'm going to um, uh, tie this up very quickly um, in the sense that I think it's OK. I think it's OK to um, either entertain your particular sexual deviation if it doesn't cause demonstrable harm to the individual that you're either fantasizing about or the individual that you're actually having sex with. Um, 
that would be sort of my green light in terms of the, the moralistic approach to this problem. If it does cause demonstrable harm, then I think that we are limited. We should be reserving our um, sexuality to simply the fantasy realm. And um, for some of these, these are really immoral, illegal in some cases, in terms of what we are allowed to have sex with. But I'll give you a, a wrap-up story here uh, very quickly, which is the case of Havelock Ellis. Havelock Ellis was a, uh, a 19th century sexologist who was particularly interested in sexual deviance. And he happened to have a particular paraphilia. Paraphilia is a love outside of the norm, clinically speaking. He was attracted to urinating, urinating women, especially women who were standing upright. He was a urophile. Um, and for all of his life, he was shamed. He, he felt tremendous um, stigma and um, a, a sense of some, uh, some being ostracized by having this particular arousal response. But when he reached the age of about 60 or so, and he became um, completely impotent, and the only way for him to actually have, have, have an erection was to observe a woman who was standing upright and urinary, urinating, um, he changed his attitude slightly. He actually began to see this as an enlightened uh, approach to human sexuality. He considered himself a, a connoisseur of pazuses. This is the word that he used. And he, um, he realized that this was the point that, that if it's not harmful, then why not? If it's not harmful, then our, our, our reservations or our reluctance to satisfy or, or obtain some sort of gratification sexually to remove ourselves from this phase of um, sexual uh, isolation, I suppose, doesn't make a lot of sense. We should simply indulge in this experience and, um, and remove ourselves from this societal prescription of what is right and what is wrong. What is normal and what is, har what is, normal and what is natural are empty philosoph philosophical questions. We should move more toward this question of defining very clearly what is harmful he obtained that by enjoying himself with urinary, urinating women. You might find yourself um, uh, thinking about your own particular se sexual deviations or paraphilias or fetishes here. And ask yourself, is it harmful? And if it's not, do it. <laughs>